I was born September 22nd, 1946 in Huntington, New York, which is out on Long Island. Uh, my mom and dad met uh, in 1942 and knew each other about three weeks. Uh, got married and dad shipped out for Saipan and Okinawa in World War II. When he came back in uh, three years or so there, they, they moved up to uh, where he was from, Long Island, New York. I was born up there and I, we stayed there either three to six months, so they tell me. And mom, being a, being a Richmond girl and a, and a Southern girl, decided that uh, she needed to come home to family. And so that's how I got to Richmond. Well, I graduated from high school in 1964. Uh, didn't know what I wanted to do, so I went to work for Medical College of Virginia, the old Medical College of Virginia, which is now VCU, and uh, just took a job. And I was making a dollar quarter an hour as a, as a helper, and I just happened to be uh, where the uh, superintendent at uh, MCV was, Mr. Johnson, when I heard him tell Miss Crenshaw, the office lady there, they were looking for an elect, you know, electrician, uh, uh, helper, and uh, they're gonna pay a dollar thirty-seven and a half cents an hour, and uh, put them on P3, which meant you got state benefits. So I said, Mr. Johnson, could I take that job? And he said, Well, yeah. He says you can. So for twelve and a half more cents an hour and a few benefits, I, uh, I got my start in the uh, electrical field. I just kind of wandered into it. I went through an apprenticeship program and I came out and I was an electrician. Uh, and, uh, got training in, uh, with different contractors to, uh, to enhance the education. Uh, I was in, in, the, in the field doing uh, different types of electrical work. And then I moved out uh, to where uh, I was a journeyman and finally to a foreman, a general foreman, and a superintendent, but it was all with a view toward uh, what I had trained for it was to be an electrician. Now, uh, my role has changed. I used to be on one side of the desk as an electrician doing things. I've moved around to the other side. I'm doing much the same thing, but just from the other side, uh, my role is uh, strictly to provide solutions to, to industry for their motor control center needs. Uh, with with uh, hindsight being 2020, I look back, uh, you can see things a whole lot more clearly now. And, and it has been, been rewarding, and, and uh, there's a lot of things that I've seen and learned. And so yeah, I would have to say I, I find it to have been, uh, to have just come into it uh, by sheer luck. Uh, I think it was a very, very good thing for me overall. Moving out of the analog age into the digital age, uh, that's, that's the biggest change. We uh, electricians uh, out of the field used to do all the wiring, uh, just just massive amounts of wiring through what I like to call clackety-clack relays. They, they just, uh, they're electromechanical and they close and uh, it's nothing like we have today with uh, smart motor controllers and variable frequency drives and, and uh, motor control centers that have overload relays. In the, in the early days, uh, a motor, uh, uh, controller. Every motor has to have a controller. Uh, every controller uh, consists of a uh, ground fault short circuit protective device, uh, or breaker or fuses, and then it has a, it has the starter, the, which is a contactor portion. Electromechanically, is held in place until a signal gives it the, the command to drop. And then it, it, they all have overload protection so that the motor won't overheat and destroy itself. And so the overload was made out of a substance called a eutectic alloy. And it would heat up, they called them heaters, thermal elements, called them heaters. And these heaters, uh, when the motor got hot, they would heat the eutectic alloy. And then when it melted, it would twist a pawl in there and drop the starter out. That's how it worked. After it cooled off, you'd reset it and you're ready to go. The interesting thing about the eutectic alloy is it is an alloy that is either solid or liquid. There's no in-between state. Now you can imagine nothing would turn much in things that were slag, you know, it would have to be uh, completely uh, liquid. But now we have overload relays that will give you 84, I think, 82, 84 parameters, it's called an E3 Plus, to tell you about what your motor is doing. 
and it takes that information through a network and puts it on software that can be put on a computer desk in an office and, and just tell you everything that's going on. For instance, if your motor is, is uh, getting bogged down and it starts heating up the heaters, it'll track that and say, if you continue running like this for a certain period of time, then your motor is going to drop down and it gives the people who are in preventive maintenance time to get there and do that. You could be on call at home and make that change. So huge change. Uh, in the older days, if we made a change, we would have to, uh, by adding another relay, we'd have to, we'd have to get inside the cabinet and if there's enough DIN rail, that'd be fine. If not, we'd have to mount another piece of DIN rail, put the new contactor in, unwire a bunch of things, rewire the things, check it out and get ready to go. With the new technology, we can even put these things in a bucket, they call it, and make changes on the fly without disruption. So it's, it's a big change. It, it's, 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 the, it's the type of change on par with us coming into the computer generation uh, at every level that we've come into it. I mean, we know everybody has a cell phone, everybody has an iPad, everybody has this, everybody has that. Back in those days, there was none of that. And uh, it's just the advent of the electronic age. That's, that's the difference. It's, it's, uh, it's just changed things in any and every way you can imagine. It, it's, it makes it easier. It makes it, as I say, more production, more efficient, but you're still limited like we were in the old days, where in the old days maybe we were limited by uh, the analog world as opposed to the digital world. The one thing that is common, however, is we are still people that have to take time to think these things through and all the things that come with just being human. Uh, that's the one thing that, that never changes. So I would say the, 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 the advent of the uh, computer like it has done with our entire world has made all the differences uh, between the way it used to be and the way it is now. It's, it, it's amazing to talk to people who are quite younger than I am and have never known anything but computers and, and things like that. Uh, and then I'll explain to them how we used to have to do it uh, in, a, in a completely slower, uh, really more difficult way. It's like describing maybe a tree to someone who's never seen any more than a desert, you know, and then maybe they haven't seen a, a, a real tall tree or something like that, you know. So generally it, it winds up where they're listening, but we could have a little humor in there too about uh, uh, the way th things have changed. And I think in general, they're probably glad they missed out the part where uh, it's not as easy as it is now. A typical work day today is I get here uh, thinking about what I'm going to do. And invariably when I check the emails or the phone, uh, I find out I'm really not gonna do that today. I'm gonna do something else. So we're always customer driven on this side. Uh, 30 years ago, uh, things were somewhat different. Uh, I'd start my day out in the field and uh, we'd always uh, meet with the men at what we call the gang box. And that's where all the, all the tools were and all the pipe benders and all the things like that. And uh, if it was a commercial or industrial drive, job, we had a, a full specifications, full sets of drawings, all the information uh, in general was provided by the architects and engineers. And uh, if you were in supervision, you would uh, have in your mind what you needed everybody to do that day, depending on the amount of men you had. Uh, some of the jobs you might have just a few men on. Other jobs I had 46 men on. So, so you would have to uh, you would have to start your day that way. You would have to take the information and disseminate it to the people that were to the electricians that were working for you. You had to make sure that uh, they understood what you wanted done. And the most important thing that I learned through all that is most people uh, want to do a good job for you. I was uh, responsible for some, for some rather large projects and it's nice and it's always fulfilling to feel like you've done a, a job. You know, you took a job. When I did the Division of Motor Vehicles over here on Broad Street, it's, it's a nine-story building and it's kind of built uh, when I say I did it, I didn't do the whole thing, but I was <laughs> the general foreman for, for E.C. Ernst. 30 other men did it. Let me put it that way. 
but uh, the, it's like two nine-story buildings and they kind of two towels are pulled like this with another nine-story building in the middle and when I went out there uh, there were there was uh, I was 29 years old and I, and I always wanted to what, what we call run a job run a project like that I'd, I'd been foreman under some general foreman and things like that before but uh, this was going to be the first job of any uh, real consequence that I was going to be tasked with. And I went out there, it was nothing but a huge uh, field out there, and they were drilling uh, caissons, and a caisson is, is drilled with a, a great big four-foot, three-and-a-half, three-foot diameter uh, drill, and it goes down. I think in the case over there, they exceed, I think they exceeded 100 feet. I'm not sure. It was 137 of them. And we had to drop wires down for the... Uh, what they call a counterpoise, so that we make sure we keep the electrical system grounded properly. And then we, as those wires came up, uh, they had to go down, I think about 30 feet in the case on as they were pouring them. So that's what was going on when I got there. It was nothing and just a mess and, and getting things like that. But when I walked away, it was all done with it several years later uh, because of the good help that, that we had out there. and. Uh, uh, good job by the architects and engineers and everyone else. I was able to walk away and have some some uh, good feeling about it, uh, accomplishing and finishing that project. I would have to say that was, uh, and any time I've worked on a project, uh, I guess I could say that's the thing. Hey, we did this. We, we you know we got it done. The, the good, the bad, the ugly, the whole works. We got it done. We walked away, and and folks are happy. And uh, that's that's a big deal for me. Do it right. Do the best you can do. You're not going to always do it right. You're going to make mistakes. Learn from your mistakes. Be honest about your mistakes. But the key is to strive to always do it right. It was taught to me. <laughs> it, was, it was advice that was passed on to me. And I, uh, and so I think it's worth worth passing on to the next generation. We're all here to do a job, do it right, do it cheerfully. Uh, leave your ego at home, you know. Uh, take people for who they are, and just uh, what a blessing the whole thing winds up to be. Now sitting here 50 years later, looking back. Didn't always see it going through as clearly as I do now, but I clearly see it now, and I'm, I'm just a a very blessed man because of all the, the things and people that I've met and uh, been through. And, uh, I'll cherish that a long time. <laughs> I told my wife that, uh, that uh, for the first little bit, I don't want to ask, I don't want to answer anything more technical than would you like to have a breakfast? <laughs> I think I'd like to try that for a while. But uh, we, 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 I'm just going to start, uh, I'm planning to just start walking every morning. I want to get that into my life, you know. And my, my wife and I uh, have been married 45 years, and, and she's a, a wonderful, wonderful woman and a wonderful partner for my life. And I just want to really spend some uh, more time with her, you know, and uh, we spend all our time together now, but it's limited uh, by work and things like that. We, we just want to uh, live like we've always lived. We're pretty simple folks, you know, it doesn't take much to keep us happy. We enjoy one another so much. And uh, the biggest thing I got planned right now, uh, right now is uh, to get up to D.C. I haven't seen the Vietnam uh, wall and I haven't seen the World War II uh, things up there and and, and we're just gonna uh, live life. We, we've got six grandkids and uh, uh, one great grandson and a great granddaughter that's going to be born any any time now and uh, we're just gonna immerse ourselves in things like that. Stay active in our church and uh, just be who we've always been. Well, let me tell you about a joke. Here it is. There was a prison, and a bunch of people were sitting around the prison. And a new guy, you know, and he was sitting there, and it was meal time. And uh, this young fellow, uh, unfortunately, had been incarcerated, and man, he was brand new and scared to death, and he didn't know what to do. So he sat down by the, 
you know, by this place there. And, and uh, he, he was just, inside, he was just, just churning and churning. You know? So all of a sudden he heard somebody holler out, 27. And, and he didn't know what they were living. And all of a sudden, everybody started laughing and laughing and laughing. And, he, and somebody said, 33. Man, he started laughing again and laughing. You know, 45, and, and man, they were really just, you know, bending over and, and laughing. And so finally, he couldn't stand it anymore. And he, he asked the fellow beside him, he said, what in the world is going on? And he says, somebody says a number, you know. He says, I don't understand. And then all of a sudden, a guy hollers out and says, 62. And nobody laughed at all. So he says, what gives it? Some people holler at a number and everybody laughs. And this guy hollers out 62 and nobody even moves. And so the guy that had been there for quite some time, he says, well, you know, some people can tell him, some can't. 